Hello YouTube and YouTubeettes. This video is about Hinduism and exposing uh, the lies of Hinduism. Um, you will notice, based upon uh, other videos that I've posted about Luciferian doctrine and the original lie of the serpent and what the Illuminati believes, etc., the ancient uh, Babylonian mystery religions, um, how uh, now, you'll see some similarities with Hinduism, and some suggest, and I've heard this before, that Hinduism is the oldest religion, uh, perhaps closely knitted to uh, the mystery religion of ancient Babylon. You will see, specifically, you, you remember one of the lies, of, or the lie of the serpent was that you could become as gods through knowledge and intellect. And... They have these gurus, these basically god men that people worship. I mean, it's, and you'll see that in this video um, that I'm gonna that I'm gonna put a, a clips from or edit from. Um, also, it uh, has become the New Age movement uh, uh, in America. I mean, uh, New Age is basically a lot of Hinduism. Uh, and perhaps minus the guru stuff, I guess, but it's still about self. Um, it's very self-centered. Um, you know, they'll talk about transcendental meditation where it's all inward. And uh, so um, I'm going to leave the, uh, also the link to the full video below. I keep forgetting to mention that, and I haven't added it to all of my videos yet, but I'm going to try to so that you can see the whole thing because I want to try to keep these fairly short. But uh, this one is called uh, Gods of the New Age, Hinduism Exposed. India, land of mystery is the seventh largest land mass and second most populated nation in the world. It is rich in resources and manpower, yet its people are among the poorest and most suffering on earth. Millions of Indians suffer from malnutrition, disease, and poverty. The people are apathetic because their religion has taught them to be detached observers, disregarding the agonizing lifestyle which imprisons them. V.S. Naipul, himself an Indian, describes India as a wounded civilization paralyzed by her religious beliefs. This complex and contradictory religion known as Hinduism promotes the worship of enlightened godmen called gurus. And countless idols. It deifies both nature and femaleness and believes mother goddess to be the original deity. She is worshipped in many forms, as Mother India venerated in the shape of her map, as Mother Earth reverenced in the cow, whose urine is even seen as sacred, in Goddess Kali, the goddess of death and destruction, who demands to be pacified with blood sacrifices, and in Holy Mother Ganges, the largest river in India. This river is worshipped by millions who flock to her banks to perform daily toiletries and annually dump hundreds of thousands of dead bodies to assure them of a better reincarnation. Its pollution does not dampen the spiritual fervor of the people who believe its waters to be essential for all religious ceremonies. 
bodies and imbued with magical and healing powers. Incredibly, the West is today looking to Hinduism's superstitions for hope. The religion that has all but destroyed India has now infiltrated every area of Western society. Protesting that it is not religious but scientific, it is transforming our minds, science, medicine, mass media, politics, and the church. Hinduism is most seductive when it wears the mask of Christian terminology and has shockingly managed to disguise itself as the latest Christian thought. Hundreds of thousands of Western pilgrims have journeyed to India seeking enlightenment and have disappeared by the hundreds. All too often they are destroyed by the madness and perversion of the very gurus they have worshipped and looked to for salvation. Today, hundreds of these professing godmen are invading the West. Is there any need for alarm? Or should we continue to welcome these gods of the new age? Here in Delhi, India, Guru Darshan Singh, only one of hundreds of gurus, has personally converted or initiated some 15,000 followers. He explains that it is the job of the guru to groom his disciples into the shortest path to salvation. Salvation is the same. But, you know, we have various paths leading to it. You know, some of the paths are long paths, other paths are the short paths. Why is a master then necessary? Master is necessary, you know, to groom you into the shortest path. Descended from a long line of Hindu spiritual masters, Rabindranath Maharaj is a former guru and accomplished yogi who was worshipped by thousands. The Hindu needed to be near his guru. The Hindu needed to consult his guru. He eventually saw his guru as the only means to salvation. It is absolutely extraordinary also to look at disciples of some of these gurus that I saw in India, for example. These adoring, huge, open eyes that just will accept mm. anything from him and that just love him beyond anything. I loved Maharishi. I worshipped him. Therefore, everything he said or did or thought was perfectly right in my eyes. I just met Bhagwan and there it was. It's nobody else than him. Bhagwan is my master and I love him. I'm in love with him. That's the only thing I can say. Guru Bhagwan Rajneesh, given refuge by the American government after fleeing his native India, has purchased a 100 square mile ranch in central Oregon, to which his red clad disciples flock from all over the world. whose astonishing title literally means highest spiritual teacher, lord of the universe, honorable sir, and king. Carol Matriciana is a journalist and author of the book, Gods of the New Age. Born and raised in India, she moved to London in 1973, where she became one of England's leading authorities on new religious movements. Prior to Rajneesh's death and the closure of his commune in Oregon, I had the unique experience of spending some time there. Rajneesh would come out twice a day in one of his 96 Rolls Royces and literally be worshipped by his thousands of Western devotees. It was so sad to see their complete devotion to a mere man who considered himself to be God. Part of his required allegiance demanded that his followers always wear orange, India's holy color, and a portrait of their master around their necks. His spokeswoman and right-hand lady, Sheila Silverman, 
tries to explain the attraction and magnetism of her master. He is something, uh, something that is so, I have no words. It is a love relationship. Master and disciple. Something happens in your heart when you see a master. <laughs> Bhagwan's my master. <laughs> Here at the Kumbh Mela Festival or Aquarian Fair, in Allahabad, India, 20 million Hindus gather to witness an endless procession of hundreds of these self-proclaimed godmen. Even the dirt beneath these gurus' feet is an aid to the disciple in his quest for salvation. This footage was covertly photographed and smuggled out of India. Naked priests are considered to be the holiest and most dedicated of guru disciples. Many cover their bodies with cremation ashes and dirt and mat cow dung into their hair. Some are armed and are dependent upon extremely potent drug concoctions. They have surrendered everything, families, possessions, and even their minds, becoming literally insane out of devotion to their guru. Well, guru is the, our best friend, philosopher, and guide, and he shows the way to God. So uh, we in our India acknowledge him as a divine power, just equivalent to God. If anyone could be near the beloved master and witness the love, the compassion, the humility, the grace, the generosity, no one in his right mind would not know that this is a walking, talking, living God on earth. In all scriptures you will find that the master is the God incarnated power working on earth. You people that interviewed this gentleman today, I don't think you knew who you interviewed, but you interviewed God. For the Hindu, the guru is all important. The guru is his lord, his master, his savior, even greater than God. Yes, guru is greater than God. I have personally talked with many, many gurus, and the sad fact is that within their belief system, they have to be detached and removed from their emotions and compassion. And their cruelty and inhumaneness is seen as spiritual and excused as holy. I was really interested in their worship and their veneration and their adoration and the gifts and offerings they brought to me. But I was certainly not interested in their problems and their difficulties and hardships and pains. The Guru followers believe that he returns this incredible love that they feel towards him. But in reality, he feeds off their emotions to maintain his own ego. So many people come here because they too are in love with Bhagwan. They too are seeking the wisdom, the love that Bhagwan has to offer. He has so much love and he gives his love to everybody and it helps us to, to find our love in ourselves. The followers of Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple, were convinced that their relationship was built on love. And nearly 1,000 of his devoted disciples committed suicide at his command. It was their final gift of total surrender to the leader they loved. Their lives cut short by a madman claiming to be God, the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Guru Sai Baba is one of India's most powerful men with millions of Indian disciples and a growing Western following. He says of himself, I am God. My power is divine and has no limit. There is no force, natural or supernatural, that can stop me 
or my mission. Prabhu Guptara, born and raised in India, is currently a journalist and media commentator in London. Gurus are going to the West because of two reasons. First, of course, they want to convert people. Uh, they want them to become followers of their own religion, in some cases themselves. And secondly, because they feel they have something to offer. What these gurus have to offer is a family, a community to belong to, which they don't have. Thousands of seekers, most of them from broken or unstable families, and already emotionally wounded, are becoming victims of the gurus. Dr. Oz Guinness, an Oxford scholar and noted world lecturer, is author of the bestseller, Dust of Death. One of the deepest longings in the modern world is for a sense of meaning and belonging, sense in their lives and sort of stability in their worlds. And people having not found that in the West are hungry for it. And reacting against the West, they're backing into the arms of the East without looking at it straight. Ed Senesi is a former member of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, known as the Hare Krishna Movement. For three years, he was editor-in-chief of their magazine, Back to Godhead. The attitude toward the family in the Hare Krishna Movement is very unfortunate. The family is seen more or less as a necessary evil. Eckhart Floter, a successful German journalist, became a devoted disciple of Rajneesh in 1979 and spent several months with him in India. Rajneesh clearly says that the family, that marriage, that all these traditional family bonds are rotten. The only relationship that counts is between his disciples and him. Kathy, devoted disciple of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for 15 years, was a teacher and governor of Transcendental Meditation, known as TM. I thought TM was strengthening my family, but it was really weakening it because I was turning all my attention in on myself if you have an allegiance to your wife or your children, to the extent that you have that dedication to those people, you are less dedicated to the organization. I either had to become a member so I could go with him, or he was going to divorce me because he was not supposed to have any outside attachments. He said it wasn't that he didn't love me anymore, and in fact, he still loved me very much. It's just that I was only human, and Bhagwan was superhuman, and therefore he was more deserving of my husband's love than I was. How many of these people loved their neighbor, their family, in this totally giving way? How Alexandra Schmidt is one of France's leading experts on new religious movements. How many have been so blind to, to all the negative aspects of a person they loved as to that of the guru? 